So this is our, our last class, and, and well, we started at 40, right? And now we're down to less than 10, but that's okay. Um, this uh, being the last class in our, our, say, 101 class here on uh, just our, our intro to orthodoxy. And this is a little bit of an intimidating class. I kind of said that before, speaking about orthodox spirituality. And one thing I said was that I, wanted to re- I just want to rebrand the name a little bit. I don't like the word spirituality. There's kind of a, a new agey aspect to it, right? I'm spiritual, but not religious, right? Kind of a, a common phrase. And then asking the question, really, what does spirituality even mean? So instead of thinking about it from that context, I would more direct it toward the question of, well, what does a Christ-centric life look like? Okay? And then how in the Orthodox Church do we view a Christ-centric life and a, a relationship that's you know, based on uh, you know, being with Christ instead of some, this nebulous term of you know, what is spirituality? Now, uh, associated with that, of course, there's a lot of practice. Okay? So how do we attribute and speak about practices within the Orthodox Church? And so we have to kind of consider our goal overall. So our goal in the Orthodox Church, or really as Christians in general, we would think of, you know, a holiness, having a, a, a life in communion with, with Christ, and then a life in which we experience continuous transformation. And Father Evan has been speaking about this, right, for the past couple of, of weeks when he's talking about repentance, And this idea of repentance, he says, you know, metanoites, which is what Christ and John the Baptist both say. And the word metanoita means to change your mind. Okay. And then again, this idea of continually changing your mind and reorienting yourself. And in that process of reorienting, right, we become transformed. Okay. So as we reorient ourselves more and more, uh, in the gospel, as we orient, reorient ourselves more and more to Christ, we become transformed through those actions. Uh, I always think of this story. I, I was visiting a monastery, and I asked the monk. This was kind of a, a young person's question. And after I said it, I was kind of embarrassed. But I was like, how do I become holy? And it just seemed a little cliche. Like right after it came out, right out, right after it came out of my mouth, I was like, oh, that was a little bit cliche. But oh, I'll just see what he says. And uh, he responded, and he said, don't worry about becoming holy. Your job is not to become holy. Instead, your d- job is really just to engage in this daily struggle. Holiness isn't something that you get. Holiness is something that happens to you. Okay? So in the life of the church, we don't seek to acquire all these things. We just go through, let's say, spiritual practices. We engage ourselves in asceticism. We try to live a Christ-centric life, and we don't transform ourselves, but rather we are transformed. Okay, so it's almost something passive that happens to us. And instead of actively doing it ourselves, we just have to be open more so to the transformation. Because being made in the image and likeness of God, we're not meant to be these broken things. And God wants us to be transformed. So really, we don't, we don't have to you know, mold ourselves. Rather, we have to just allow ourselves to be open to be molded. So there's a little bit you know, of an, an, an orientation that we have to put ourselves in and, and who is actually doing the work here. So when we talk about asceticism and these spiritual practices, it's not us doing the work, but just putting ourselves in a situation so that God can work within us. You see the difference a little bit between the two? So it's kind of an, an important thing to realize. And we, we, see, it, we see this a lot in, in you know, many of the stories in the gospel, especially in the parables. I'm always reminded of the uh, man who sweeps his house and cleans out the demon, right? So he cleans his house and, and kicks out the demon, and then he has an empty house. So what happens? Not just one demon, seven demons come back, right? So he's prepared the space, he's kicked out the old demon, but he never went through a process of, let's say, inviting the good house guests in. So in that way, our, our, our goal in spiritual practice is twofold. Yes, that we, that we you know, ascetically practice this life in Christ, and then we invite Christ in to transform us. 
Because at the end of the day, we're, we're very much passive beings. We're meant to be inhabited. We're meant to be possessed, okay? Which is a weird thing to say that we're meant to be possessed. But I say possessed in the, in, the, in the aspect of we're meant to be owned in a way by God, right? We're meant to belong to God. I said this before, that this is what the term Christian means. It's one who belongs to God, all right? And so in this process of belonging to God, wherever God is present, evil, the demons, these things can no longer exist. Uh, St. Porfirios, I think I'd mentioned him before. He was a saint of the 20th century. He said, don't ever try to fight the darkness. He's like, if you just try to fight the darkness, you will lose. Instead, just turn on the light. It's a pretty simple thing. But he's pointing out that you on your own can't fight the demons. You can't fight the devil. But if you just invite Christ into your life, then he does the fighting for you. Okay? Now, there is obviously an aspect of asceticism and, and facing our own passions and these kinds of things, right? Facing our sins. But in the end of the day, we don't do these things on our own. Instead, we, we invite Christ in order to do that, that work for us. So our goal then in, 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 uh, in one of the Psalms says, create in me a clean heart, O God, and put a new, new and right spirit within me. So we, we ask for God to come to cleanse us and, and to do this work himself. Now, with, with that little bit to say, what's like practically the steps that we take? And this is where it gets tricky, right? To think that there is a, a single path that we all take is a mistake, we are all very unique, and we're coming from different backgrounds. Even this quote that we heard today, right, Father Evan mentioned that Dr. Rossi had said. Um, actually, Father Evan mentioned that his daughter heard from Dr. Rossi, but uh, said, don't judge other people by your sins or by their sins. What was it? They sin differently, they sin differently than you. Perfect. So other people are going to sin differently than you, and it's easy to look at those things and say, oh, how could they do that? right? Like I think of myself, I'm not an alcoholic. And I look at people who are and be like, that's so foreign to me to even think about how somebody can do that, right? And then somebody else would look at, you know, what I do and think, oh, how could they do, how could he do those things? So we have to be careful on how we, you know, look at other people and not judge, what was it again? Don't judge because they sin differently. Don't judge because they sin then you're okay. Then you're okay, yeah. So, so with that, I mean, every, we all have, you know, different a sin that afflicts us. Then, um, you know, our path to holiness, our, our ascetic struggle is also going to be different for each of us, okay? And with that, there's no formula then that we can explicitly follow. And we're going to talk about this, you know, quite a bit in that... A single Christian is not a Christian. In other words, you can't be a Christian on your own, right? You have to be Christian inside of a community uh, for several different reasons, right? We're called to love. That's, that's one of the, the great commandments. The two greatest commandments being love the Lord your God. And then the second greatest commandment, love your neighbor as you love yourself. So these are the two great commandments. How can you love outside of relationship? Okay? How can you love outside of a community? How can you exercise these greatest commandments without some kind of community? And that's something that not only you do you know, for the other person, but it's something that happens to you as well. Right? When you live in a community with other people, you love the other people. But just as importantly, the other people love you too. And that mutual relationship is what becomes transformative. So in, in this, this life in the church, and my, my spiritual father, he always told the story of um, uh, stones in the river, right? You take a bu- bunch of rough stones and you put them, put them in a river, and what happens over time? They smooth each other out, right? They bump up each other, and they're, they're all angled at first, and they start to chip away with each other, at each other over and over and over again. And then slowly over time, those rough-hewn stones become very smooth, so in a community, this is what we're doing. And it's painful and it's hard and, you know, you fight and you're, the people that you love become your enemies one day and then the next day, you, you know, you make, make amends and you ask forgiveness. 
So through this process of, of perfecting ourselves, right, through living in a community, it's painful and it's difficult. Um, but it's also, you know, the good work that we participate in. Um, so that's, that's certainly one of the, you know, initial things that we do. We, we exist inside of a community. So, Jeff, you asked the question earlier of, well, what do I do to become a catechumen? You're working on that process, right? People will say, how do I join the Orthodox Church? Step one is go to church, engage and be part of the community, all right? You're not just a Christian being at home reading books, okay? You can, let's say, theologically and doctrinally uh, take on all the, the qualities of being Orthodox, but if you don't practice it in the life of a community, then it's very difficult. And I don't even mean in, in necessarily the community of an Orthodox church, right? You can live in the middle of nowhere where there's no churches, this happens, um, but you live in your local community, whether it's your family, your friends, at work, wherever you happen to be, and you participate in that community. So being a part of a community is a huge part of this, let's say, practical aspect of um, being in the church and, and developing this life in Christ. And obviously, along with that are all of those qualities uh, that we think of, right? Our virtue isn't something that can be practiced in isolation. Can't practice love. We can't practice kindness. We can't practice uh, forgiveness. Can't practice any of these virtues without another person. So, so these, are, these are qualities that we want to continue to develop, and we can only do so in, in a specific, you know, the context of, of other people. And... Um, so uh, the, the rules then are not just the, the basis for our, for our life in the church. I I'm, uh, remember, uh, remember the, the story of the, the young man, and he goes up to Christ and he says, Good teacher, what do I need to do to an, inherit eternal life? And Christ's first response is? Keep the command. You, know the commands. you know the commandments. Obey your father and mother. Do not kill. Do not commit adultery, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. And there were a lot of commandments in the Old Testament, right? 600 plus, whatever it is. And what does the young man say? Hey, I've done all those things. And super impressive, right? Super impressive to do all the commandments. And then Christ responds and says, of course, you lack one thing. Go sell what you have and come and follow me. And that's the most important thing. Right? Even if you don't follow any of the commandments, if you give up what you have and come and follow Christ, then this is, this is the most important part. So it can be a, a, a temptation, a huge temptation to just look at the rules, follow the rules. Oh, I fast on Wednesdays and Fridays. Oh, I always go to church. I do all these things. I say my prayers in the morning and the evening. Uh, you know, I, I, everything I, I'm meant to do, I do. And yet, if you don't uh, develop this life in Christ, then it's all for naught. You would literally have been wasting your time. So how do we do that? That's kind of the tricky part, right? Because it seems like, especially here in the Orthodox Church, right, we have a lot of things that you can do. We've got a lot of services, right? The liturgical life of the church is extremely rich. You can pick up a prayer book, and prayer books are you know, hundreds of pages long, and you can find a prayer for every single uh, blessing, for every day, for everything that you're about to do, and, uh, you know, for every time of day, a service is saint for every time of year, and you can do all those things, and uh, it's, it can be very easy to just get trapped in thinking that that is enough, um, but there's, there's so much more, and those really are the, I want to say, those are the lesser part of what it means to be a Christian, because uh, we can always point to the Pharisees, right? The Pharisees did everything right on paper. They did everything right. And yet they were outstripped by the publican, the tax, pe- tax collector, who simply asked for forgiveness and repented uh, standing in the back of the temple. And those, that kind of action is really the hardest thing that we can do, okay? To recognize in ourselves that we are sinners, and that we are in need of this repentance. And I'm always reminded of St. Paul when he says that I am the worst of sinners. St. Paul saying that he's the worst of sinners. So how do we take on that, let's say, mindset uh, in our lives? And by taking on that mindset, then allow ourselves to be transformed. 
So this is the, the tricky and hard work of being in the church. And again, it's, there's, no, there's no one formula um, for what that looks like. It, only, it comes about just by being in the life of the church in communion, in community with the spiritual father and other people who are struggling along with you. And so a lot of this conversation, I feel like, has a dissatisfaction almost associated with it. Because you might walk out and be like, I, I don't even know what I'm supposed to do next. Not necessarily a bad thing, um, except to just live in the life of the church. And that takes time. It takes, takes uh, time and, um, let's say, experience to just understand what that means. And along with that, it takes the experience of a guide typically in the church, right? A, a spiritual father who can, you know, convey wisdom that was passed on to him. Not just spiritual father, but, you know, spiritual mother, anybody who's, you know, a mentor in the community and to continue to live the, the life uh, under the guidance of that person. I'm, I'm going to tell a couple of stories. Uh, I love stories. And uh, the first one is from the, the sayings of the Desert Fathers. So the Desert Fathers were... Uh, basically monastic communities from about the 4th to the 6th or 7th century, where, let's say, they're the peak of the, the period of the, spiritual, uh, of the Desert Fathers. And most of them were the Egyptian desert. And there was one elder, his name was Elder Piman, and he was very well known. And people would come and visit him from all over the place to get his advice. And this, this man from Alexandria hears about him, and he has this question of, what do I need to do to inherit the kingdom of heaven? And then he wanted to talk about the kingdom of heaven. Seems pretty reasonable, right? So he makes this long trek across the Egyptian desert out of Alexandria. You know, some days it takes him to travel across the desert to re- reach the, the, the desert cell of Elder Piman. And he raps on the door and the elder, this is, you know, a fourth century. He's a holy man. He knew this guy was coming. And so as soon as the guy walks in, he starts like jumping on his bed and kind of acting goofy and crazy and, you know, throwing things around the room and, you know, just acting really silly. And this guy is scandalized by this situation. He's like, what? I came to this guy for this, you know, advice and he's just, he's a nut. And so he leaves and he starts walking, you know, way back across the Egyptian desert, back to Alexandria. And halfway through his journey, he realizes, wait a second. I need to find out what was going on because he was, you know, he did an injustice to me. I had this honest question for him and he was just acting crazy. So he turns around and goes back and again knocks on his door. And this time when he walks in, the elder's in his right mind sitting on his bed and the guy uh, lambasts him a little bit. You know, he says, I came to you and I wanted to ask you a question about the kingdom of heaven and you're just crazy and I felt like I couldn't talk to him. And the elder responds and says, if you want to talk about the kingdom of heaven, I have nothing to say to you. But if you want to work on your passions, if you want to work on transforming yourself, then we can talk. So in other words, we can be up here all the time, right? Just talk about what it means to go to heaven. Just talk about all these, you know, great things, idealized things, you know, dogma, high theology, all these things in the church when really we need to be concentrating on our own selves, concentrating on what our sin is, on on how we can continue to repent. And then, like I said at the beginning, these actions happen to us. The kingdom of heaven comes to us. It dwells inside of us. It's not something that we acquire on our own. So so concentrating really on on our own struggle through a guide is what becomes most important. And then each of our struggles is going to be very different from each other, right? Uh, Another story that reminds me of this is uh, St. Paisios. He was a a recent saint and died in the 90s again. And he tells this story of a monk on Mount Athos where they, they lived who was always drunk. And he always scandalized all the visitors that came to the monastery. And one day he died. And all of the other monks were a little happy because they thought, oh, here was this monk who was always causing so much trouble because he was always drunk. And uh, so they were happy that he was dead. 
And St. Paisios comes over and he kind of flips it on them. He says, ah, you're happy because Father so-and-so is now rejoicing and praying for you in heaven. And they're like, what? Father so-and-so, the, the drunk? He's like, yeah. It's like he was drunk all the time and causing a ruckus. He never went to church, all these different things. And he said, well, what you didn't know is that when he was raised, he was raised in Asia Minor. And his parents, in order to have him not stolen by the Turks, would give him alcohol when the Turks came around. And they would, in order to keep him quiet when he was a baby. So even from when he was a baby, he was basically an alcoholic. And then he came to the monastery because he knew this was one of the only places that, it w- that he could start to learn to control being an alcoholic. And throughout his life, he started off you know, drinking 20 you know, shots of ouzo a day. And by the end of his life, he was only drinking two or three a day. But even that small amount still got him drunk at the end of his life. And so it was this ascetic struggle that earned him his you know, crown in heaven. And not some arbitrary, you know, line of what it means to be holy or what it means to be sanctified or, okay, you've, you've done enough here, right? And as long as you make it across that, that boundary, then you're okay. What we see is a lot, we see a lot of these stories in the life of the church. Um, there was another one of, uh, at the monastery of Simonopetra, there was a, a monk that was living there and none of the other fathers knew much about him. But he got to sleep on a bed, and all of the other monks were sleeping on the floor. And so after, you know, some period of time, the other monks were saying, you know, complaining to the abbot and saying, why does he get to sleep on the floor? I mean, why does he get to sleep on a bed and we all have to sleep on the floor? And they complained about this over and over again, and the abbot was like, just leave it be. And they kept complaining and complaining. And then one day the abbot said, fine, you want to know the truth? You all are peasants. You slept on the floor your entire life. He used to be royalty. He was a king. He had servants and a castle and lavish quarters. So for him to sleep on a simple bed is more asceticism than you have ever done by sleeping on the floor that you've always slept on. Uh, So in other words, just highlighting this, you know, need of us to to simply concentrate on ourselves, our own spiritual life, our own ascetic struggle, and not look outward at all. Because we are all in completely, you know, different positions in our lives. Uh, And it's a tricky thing, right? It's a really tricky thing, yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It doesn't, and it doesn't matter how fast we're going. Right. Um, again, my spiritual father said, when you look at people in their spiritual lives, you don't know if they're running, they're walking, they're crawling, or they're dragging themselves. Say, like, just leave them be. Wherever they are, leave them be. And you could see somebody, and you might think they're dragging, but they're actually running doing a much better job than you so it's a it's a hard thing you know to look at ourselves and and uh see ourselves as the one as the ones that are dragging right i'm the one that needs to improve i'm the one that that needs to continue in my own spiritual life um and uh it's hard this is probably the hardest one of the hardest things about just being in community being in the church is measuring ourselves only Right? And not measuring, you know, the, the sins of other people. And then we, we look to repent ourselves. Uh, Saint, Saint Porfirios, he also said that, that everyone else should go to heaven before me. It's like, and if I go to heaven, then, or, or if they all go to heaven, then I am un, undeserving of this thing. So, so living with that mindset, really, I think if, if we can live in that mindset... Whatever we do, whatever we, you know, accomplish or, or strive to do in the church will be blessed. It will be a good thing. So really everything in the church in a way is about developing that mindset. Now, there's an aspect of care that we have to do with that as well in that it's not despair, right? That obtaining this mindset isn't, you know, beating ourselves over the back. It's not whipping ourselves it's not saying, oh, I'm the worst, therefore, 
you know, I'm completely unworthy of everything, I'm disfigured, and I can't be forgiven, that's taking it too far, right? When we hear about the sin or blasphemy against the Holy Spirit, blasphemy against the Holy Spirit is the very aspect of saying, I cannot be forgiven. That's what blasphemy against the Holy Spirit is, okay, if you know that line by Christ. It says, you can be forgiven for blasphemy against God, but if you blaspheme against the Holy Spirit, you will not be forgiven. And that's not to say that if you do it once, you can't be forgiven. It literally means that you are saying that God can't forgive you. I am too big of a sinner for God to forgive me. So we don't live there either. And there's this great Greek word, harmolipi, fantastic Greek word. It means joyful sorrow, joyful sorrow. So we live our entire life in anticipation, right? In the joy of the kingdom of heaven. We participate actively now in the kingdom of heaven. But at the same time, we recognize our sinfulness and our need for repentance, right? So we, in in our life of repentance, we don't just, oh, hi. Oh, like 15 minutes? Uh, so in our, in our life of repentance, we, we are continually torni- turning back to Christ. Okay, great. Thank you. He's going to come and finish up the class today. It's kind of those next steps you asked about, Jeff. Um, so, so this, this uh, uh, life of, of repentance, of turning toward Christ and turning away, that's the joyful sorrow. Joy of turning away to- toward Christ. And the sorrow of recognizing, let's say, where we came from. But they're, they're, in this life, they're, you don't, we don't separate them. Okay? We, we always recognize our need for repentance. And again, repentance isn't a sorrowful thing. Right? It might involve tears, of course. Right? You recognize your sin and you weep over your sins. But it's always with this expectation of forgiveness. Okay? For me, like the story of the prodigal son, it gets me every time, every single time, that here is the, you know, the son that is in the lowest of the low, and he has this moment where his, his guts turn. It's kind of how, how it's said, like his innards turn, right? You probably had an experience in, in, in different ways where you have that visceral emotion, right? It's all the way down in your stomach. And he returns to God, his father. And his father rushes out and greets him. And he doesn't just sit in his sin, right? He could have just stayed there in the pigsty and thought, you know, this is where I deserve to be. No, that's not where we deserve to be. We were created to be with God. So we recognize our sin, yes. We recognize that, yeah, we're in a pigsty. But that's not where we're meant to. To be. And it doesn't have to be where we will be. We just take that step. We incline our hearts to God, and he sees us from a distance, and he's always looking for us, and he rushes out to greet us. So we live in that, let's say, expectation of, of hope, and then recognizing our need for repentance in ourselves. So that's that two-sided you know, aspect of the, the harmolipi joyful sorrow that we, that we participate in. And so, you know, there, there's that, that idea of the mindset, right? So starting to develop this mindset. And then, of course, there's a practicality that's associated with that as well. Like, how do we live this out? Uh, you know, practically speaking, obviously, we go to church, we participate in the community, and we're given some ascetic practices by Christ himself. He says, when you pray, when you fast, when you give alms. These aren't an if statement, right? He says, when you do these things. And then he instructs us on how to do those things. So the church has continued to develop them in very specific ways. There is a prayer life of the church. And when you start developing these kinds of practices, we've spoken about this before, that life in the church, life in Christ is, is a relationship. And we can govern this relationship just like we would speak about relationship with uh, spouses or friends, you have to be in constant communication with someone, right? Uh, you say good morning, you say good evening, you, ta- you have your meals, you know, with your family, and we have ex- essentially the same expectation of a life with Christ. So morning prayers, evening prayers, prayers at, at the time of meals, 
And then throughout the day, we're meant to pray as well. St. Paul says that we should be praying without ceasing. So practically, well, what does that mean? Well, speaking about, let's just, let's start on, um, uh, let's talk about the rhythm of a day just in terms of a relationship. Like I said, in, in a relationship, you have these times that you set apart, right? You might always decide, okay, we're going to have dinner together, right? And during dinner, you're going to talk about your day, okay? These are important parts about being in a relationship, that you have times that you set apart for another person, and then you, you know, engage in conversation. This is what I would call is the, the established part of a prayer life. So for that, um, if you haven't started to develop something like this, a set of prayers that you say in the morning and the evening, and I mean a minute. If you, if you can't do five minutes, do a minute. If you can't do a minute, do 10 seconds. If you can't do 10 seconds, just do a cross when you wake up in the morning and a cross when you go to sleep at night, and that's enough. Right? We offer what we can, and God takes what we can, and then, you know, over time multiplies it. Very much the spiritual life, I mean, it's an ascetic struggle, right? It's difficult. There's parts of it that are difficult. If you play a sport, right, if, you, if you're a marathon runner, you don't just get out there and, you know, run 26 miles one day. Instead, you go out, you run one mile for a week, and then you run two miles for a week, and then you run three miles for a week, and you build up your stamina. The same thing is the case for the spiritual life. You don't just start off and say, okay, I'm going to pull out my prayer book, and my prayer book says evening prayers. If you pull out the Orthodox prayer book that says evening prayers, it's like 20, 25 pages long. And you think, well, this is what the Orthodox Church says I'm supposed to be doing for my evening prayers. Okay, it's going to take me about 25, 30 minutes to say these every night. Guess what? It's like running a marathon straight out. It's going to be really, really hard. You might succeed for a few days, a few weeks, maybe even a few months. But without the foundation below that, it's very hard to just jump into that kind of prayer life. And the same thing in the morning, right? If you pull out the morning prayer book, it's going to be, it's like 20, 25 pages long. And if you just try to do all that, and then you try to do all the prayers in the evening, now all of a sudden you've got an hour out of your day that you're, that you're doing this. And it's, I'm not saying it's a bad thing, but it's really, really difficult. It's really difficult to start from the beginning and do those kinds of things. All right? So, you know, certainly, and, and then all this, like I said, is done within the context of a relationship. So speaking with, with somebody who is a mentor, uh, you know, a spiritual father in the church, somebody who's just been in the church for a while, and saying, this is what I'd like to do. And usually when people come to ask, you know, ask me, I say, okay, here, say these couple little prayers. It'll take you two minutes in the morning, two minutes in the evening, and you're done. And then from there, you, you know, you've, you've run your, your 5K race for a while, and then you're like, okay, now we can start training for the 10K. You know what I mean? And then you start developing uh, your prayer life in, in, in that way as well. And then, so let's call that the, the static prayers, those things that you are, are fixed at during the day. I'm sorry, that they're fixed in your morning and your evening and then just doing a cross for, uh, you know, your meals. I, I would also say that there's that extemporaneous prayer a little bit that occurs as well, just like you would have in the house, right? You pass somebody else in the house and you have a quick conversation, you engage, you're around each other and you're talking. Uh, we have that kind of prayer in the church as well. And that can be anything, right? One, we, we live in this life of gratitude. We should always be having gratitude. And so just saying simple things like, thank God during the course of the day. It's a very easy practice to participate in, um, giving glory to God, praise to God at any moment during the day for no reason, just because. And then really the foundation of what we would say is this continuous prayer is what's called the Jesus prayer, which is Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. And this could be said in many different ways. Uh, I've always been partial to just Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me. Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me. And it's something you can, re- you can say all day, very, very easily. And a lot of people have a kumbuskini, a prayer rope, prayer rope, prayer rope, prayer rope. And with the prayer rope, you, it's, it's a physical, tangible reminder of, of, to, of praying, right? You just flip your fingers through the beads and you say 
a Jesus prayer on each prayer rope. It's a very easy thing that can be done during the day. Um, and then, you know, having, having this prayer on your lips over time, it just starts to develop itself in a way. The Holy Spirit starts to really, in a way, pl- pray this prayer through you. And it just becomes a part of your life. And this is how we can pray without ceasing. Um, again, there's no pressure here. It's not, okay, now I need to start doing this at every moment of the day. No. When you can, you do. Try to set aside you know, specific moments to have set prayers. And then just remember God during the rest of your day. This is just very practical you know, much easier things than you can do. But with all this, there's, there's no reason to be intimidated or, you know, nervous or worrying about doing too much or too little. Again, most important to be uh, in the context of a relationship. And when we're, when we're talking about this life of, of growing spiritually and growing, uh, you know, practically in the church, we, we have to be careful that, again, this isn't a uh, developing a life in the church isn't, a, isn't about becoming moral, right? Our goal isn't morality. Now, we become moral, hopefully, you know, within a life in the church, but that's not our ultimate goal. A lot of times um, people judge holiness by morality or they judge uh, holiness by having a certain virtue or a certain characteristic or you meet somebody who's really friendly and outgoing and nice, and you're like, wow, that, that's a holy person. And then you contrast that with somebody who might be very quiet or gruff or short or whatever, and be like, not a holy person. And um, I was at, I have a lot of these little monastery stories. I was at another monaster, monastery, and there was this nun there who was so fabulous. She was just so sweet, outgoing. I mean, just one of these people who just wants to pour out love on everyone, right? extremely hospitable uh you know she'd show us around and cook us food and take care of us and she was just really a joy to be around and we, a few of uh friends were together and we we spoke to the abbess and one of my friends said is she a saint and the abbess goes why because she's nice <laughs> like uh, you think that sainthood is being nice we're like whoa I know she's like, that's not sainthood at all. She's nice because it's her disposition, right? Her personality is inclined toward that, and she does a good job of it. She wasn't necessarily tearing her down, but at the same time, she was trying to emphasize that there isn't a personality type that we should all be looking to become, right? You see somebody in uh, the parish or, you know, at home or, or elsewhere, and you're like, oh, that person just seems so loving all the time. That's great, but that's not the metric that we all need to be aiming for, right? There are just as many paths to holiness. There are just as many personalities. We're not uniform, okay? Life would just be really boring if everyone was just this happy-go-lucky person all the time. So you can have the alcoholic that's a saint. You can have the gruff person that's a saint. You can have an angry person that's a saint. It's not about reaching some level of moral perfection, Just like Father Evan was talking about today, uh, holiness comes about through constant repentance. And if you're repenting every day for your entire life, then you're a saint. That's what it means. That's really what it means. And there's there's not that bar. I, I, I keep coming back to the same idea. There's not that bar that we're reaching. There's not that specific person uh, that we're supposed to come, become. Instead, we're all meant to become the person that we individually were meant and created to be. All right? And I just, that struck out so strongly for me. And, and the abbess was almost caught off guard uh, by our question. Because she's like, that's such a silly question. Um, you know, that just because she's a nice person that all of a sudden she's a saint. Versus, you know, sister so-and-so who who can't stand talking to the pilgrims, but is holier by, you know, some metric, right? So um, that it's just something to be mindful of, that if you see that person, don't think, I need to be more like that person, okay, in terms of personality, right? There's, remember, I, I think I mentioned this before in, in terms of the lives of the saints. We're not meant to emulate the lives of the saints. We're meant to emulate what? This was a while ago. Sorry? 
Christ, yes, but in terms of the lives of the saints. No, not even their deeds. This is, a, this is maybe a little small, but we're meant to emulate their zeal, their desire, their, their, um, you know, their direction pointing toward Christ, right? Some of the lives of the saints are extraordinary. There's nothing, we could never, ever do something like that. And so if we look at the lives of the saints and say, oh, I'm going to emulate that, we're, we've made a mistake. Instead, we emulate their zeal. We emulate their desire. We emulate um, their devotion to God, but not their exact actions, right? We don't become them in terms of what their personality is. We don't take their sayings and make them our own sayings. Instead, we, we take on their devotion, and through that devotion and our repentance and Christ transforming us, we become, again, who we were meant to be. Exactly. Right, exactly. Yeah. I think I, told, I might have told this story in here or in a previous, the, uh, the, the class on lives of the saints. When St. Basil died, um, everybody in the city started dressing like him and speaking like him. And his good friend, Gregory the theologian, writes this uh, eulogy, and he makes fun of these people. He says in the eulogy, he's like, and all you who have put on his clothes and taken up his manner of speaking, you do a dishonor to the saint. Instead of taking on these outward appearances, which is a very much what I would call in our personality in a way, you know, oh, he, he was always kind to these people, he always did these. Instead of taking on their, his outward appearances, take on his devotion to Christ. So Gregor the theologian just like, again, really picks on them in this sermon. Um, because these outward appearances are not what we look to for the saints. We look to their devotion to God. To, and then there, there are these particular characteristics, like you brought up, Matt, that you might want to emulate the patience of someone, not in the way that they did it, but this is a characteristic that you want to develop, right? And we, we do recognize our shortcomings, most of us, right? And as we continue in the spiritual life, we continue to recognize our shortcomings, and then you say, oh, I need to work on my anger. Therefore, you know, I can really identify with Saint so-and-so who had this problem and, you know, fought the demons in this way. And like, okay, I can identify with that saint, right? Um, yeah, yeah, definitely don't punch the bishop. <laughs> don't punch the bishop. Bad idea. <laughs> Bad, bad idea in general, yeah, no. Yeah, so St. Nicholas, right, he punches Arius, who's a priest, actually. He pun I've heard it was either Arius himself or was the bishop representing him. Oh, I've always heard it as Arius. I like it as Arius better. So he, 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 he punches Arius, right, when he's, when he's speaking about the divinity of Christ. And uh, he gets kicked out of the synod. And then that night, the head of the synod has a, basically a dream that says, nope, you need to get him back in because he was right to do that. So, for, for St. Nicholas, it was right to punch the person in the face. Um, but it's not right for you to punch somebody in the face. So don't, don't do that. Yeah. So, um, uh, with, with all of this, I'm, I'm really just trying to, you know, emphasize these ideas of uh, living this life, not following a set of rules, um, the rules aren't bad, okay? The rules aren't bad, but it can't, it's not the end goal. It's not where we're trying to end up. Instead, we're trying to end up in relationship. Again, if we, if we come back and bring this to, uh, you know, a, a marriage, you can do, you can make dinner, right? You can take care of the kids. You can do all these X, Y, Z things, but that doesn't necessarily, or, and, and you might know everything about the other person, right? But having all those characteristics doesn't make you a good spouse. I mean, it helps, right? 
if you do the dishes and walk the dog and take care of the kids and change diapers, like certainly helps. And even if you know something a lot about, if, if you know a lot about your spouse, that helps too. But that's not it, right? That's not the magic formula. Instead, it, it's different for each relationship. And the same thing is the case for friendships, right? You might do all you know, these, like, these uh, uh, things for another person. You might know everything about the other person. But it takes more than just knowledge in order to be in a relationship with somebody. It takes you know, an active and engaging spirit to, to, to develop that relationship and to continue the relationship. So, you know, again, I think Father Evan will probably be here momentarily, but I'll kind of finish here in that as, as you begin and continue, you know, in your life uh, in Christ, in the church, that you continue to develop prayer in the church and, and take advantage of the, the spiritual tools, say, that the church has offered us. Uh, confession, you know, always living in a uh, place of repentance and then finding a, a spiritual father, not as someone who's going to be your, you know, elder, who's going to be this fount of wisdom, who's going to change everything in your life, but rather as someone who can be that guide, who's someone who's going to stand next to you when you're struggling and help you and help you develop. Yes, Anna. Oh, tell him five minutes and we're ready to go. Um, he's got a little uh, messenger, and then and then through this process that we that we sanctify and offer our day continually to God, right? That we always offer ourselves and everything that we do to God, live in, in thankfulness and gratitude, and even those things that we struggle with. I, I love the story of St. John Chrysostom. Uh, he was the Archbishop of Constantinople, and he winds up getting exiled from Constantinople like three times. And on the third time, he dies. So he's exiled from Constantinople by the emperor. And on his deathbed, in exile, sick, he, his, his last words are, glory to God for all things. And this kind of is a little bit, uh, not a mantra, but even those things that we struggle with, we give glory to God. Right? Oh, I lost my God. I I lost my job. Glory to God. Why? Who knows? Uh, but we we put ourselves into uh, the loving embrace of Christ, who is always looking to you know upbuild us, and everything that that happens to us is somehow transformative in our lives. And even if it seems like it's something bad, we can always put it in the context of you know glory to God for all things. And um, obviously for the good things, we give thanks to God. But mysteriously, even for the things that are difficult in our lives, we give thanks to God. Not that God has caused those things purposefully, right? We don't believe that, that God is some, somehow punishing us or that, um, you know, he's caused something purposefully. But rather that that struggle, that difficult thing comes as an opportunity for us to be transformed, okay? That a struggle happens, and not that God has, has caused it, but that through that struggle, we can continually be transformed. And so living in that mindset um, as well. And of course, you know, we forgive quickly. We live in the, the worship and the liturgical life in the church. We engage in pilgrimages. We engage in retreats. We engage in spiritual reading, uh, reading the scriptures. Uh, a, a great thing to do is if you can read one chapter from the New Testament every day. If you can do that, you get through all the Gospels in three months, and you get through all the epistles in three months. So that means in the whole year, you'll read the whole t New Testament twice. And it's five minutes to read a chapter. So one, one chapter a day from the New Testament. It's a great, like, easy thing to do every day. Yes. Yeah. And so that's been an easy thing to follow through with. Yeah. And, and you'll, you, you start to develop, of course, your own, um, let's say, you know, liturgical life and, and your own prayer life. It's going to be different from everyone else, right? A according to those things that you know, are important to you. I love the Psalms. I, I really, really love the Psalms. 
So the, the Psalms can be read in pieces, right? You can just read one, two, or three Psalms a day, except for Psalm 118, because that one's really long. Um, but you can, you know, choose on how to break up the Psalms and read those every day, you know, in line with, with uh, the New Testament every day. But again, you know, being mindful of what your abilities are and, and slowly working into these things, okay? And one thing that, that uh, um, I think Father Evan told me years and years ago, I always struggle with saying my prayers before going to bed because it's like I go to bed late. I go to bed at like midnight. I just cannot make myself go to bed earlier. And by the time it's midnight, I'm tired. And then what do you think? Ah, I'm just going to go to bed. Which means when should you say your prayers? Nine o'clock. Say it three hours before going to bed. Don't wait until you're tired. Practical advice, right? Um, he said that to me years and years ago. I was like, oh, that's really good. Um, so don't wait until you go to bed before you say. If you want to say something, just do your cross before you go to bed. And that's it. Just go to sleep. Um, but if you've got an evening prayer that you're trying to say, say it, um, say it before, way before you're actually tired enough to go to sleep. And the same thing in the morning. I, I go to bed late and then I wake up and I'm out, out like bed to front door in 15 minutes. I mean, that's like everything, Make, making coffee, you know, getting dressed, putting the dog out, feeding the dog, 15 minutes. I don't know. I just don't like that morning routine. I like it to be as quick as possible. And so, you know, you can save your morning prayers for some time in the morning where, you, you know, you have a little bit more time. So just like practical, you know, kinds of tips as well um, that, are, that are really helpful. And then the last thing I, I would say is living, living in the life of the church and, and, and obedience in the life of the church. Obedience is kind of a, a term that's misunderstood in the church. When we think of obedience, we might think like slavery or, oh, not my own will or, you know, any of these kinds of things. And not my own will is part of it, but we are obedient to the life of the church in order to free ourselves. And it also frees us from the rules of the church as well in a lot of ways. One, one last story here, and uh, Father Owen, I think, will work his way in. Uh, again, a monastery story, sorry. Um, this monastery I was staying at, its, it's uh, feast day is for St. George. And they are having a big uh, service for the feast of St. George. And the cook said, I really want to go to the service. These are like all night vigils, like 12 hours. And he want, really wanted to go to church. And the abbot's like, yeah, but we really need you to cook. Because after the 12 hours is done, we go to the meal. Right after church is over, they go to the meal. And so the monk's like, I'm really bummed. You know, I'd, I'd like to go to church, but the abbot told me to go to, uh, to cook. So he winds up spending, you know, a large portion of the night cooking. And he's cooking for, oh, what, 300 people, right? A lot of people will come to these monasteries for the feast days. And everyone else is in church experiencing this, you know, beautiful service. And he's in the kitchen. And while he's in the kitchen, St. George comes and visits him. And he winds up having this experience of the saint. So through his obedience, he winds up getting a visitation from the saint while everyone else is in church, you know, singing hymns and participating in the services, but not having a direct visit from the saint. So if we just think, you know, of what I want to do, what I think is the best thing, you know, I need to be in church. I need to do these things. These, this is what I need to do. And, you know, the church is saying you should be doing this or, you know, you need to do this other thing or, hey, why don't you skip church today? That's okay. We don't live in this legalistic view of what it means to be in the church. Father Evan has this great story. He was very uh, strict with himself and judging other people for fasting. And his spiritual father said, all right, during Lent, you're going to get a hamburger. And when he was at seminary, you're going to get a hamburger and you're going to eat in the middle of the dining hall and you're going to have a hamburger every day. It's like, what? It's like, this is Lent. We're fasting. He's like, yeah, but you've lost what it means to fast. And so he had to eat, his fast was to eat a hamburger in front of everybody else during Lent. So, it's, now it's not an aspect of laxity, right? It's not that you're strict or lax on fasting. It's that you do it in the context of a, of a relationship. And if you're fasting just 
because, then you're missing the point. Sure. And, and again, that's, you know, every, every spiritual father is going to be different. And when you put yourself under the obedience of a spiritual father, that's it. That's where you are. And it's not that he's right versus someone else is right versus someone else is right. There's no metric. There's no exact, this is where, you know, I, I, oh, I, he's too easy on me. I want to go to someone who's more difficult. No. If he's your spiritual father, you do what he says. And it's freeing, believe me, it's freeing to be there. Because whoever you're with, right, whoever you're under, if you go from person to person, it's always going to be their fault, right? It's like, it's like a person who can't keep a job for more than six months. And every time they leave, oh, my boss did this. Oh, my boss, you know, couldn't do this. After four or five times, you hear the same argument, you're like, I wonder if it's your boss or if it's you. So in putting ourselves, uh, you know, under an obedience in that way, we take away that choice. And there's, again, there's no like, you know, spiritual vat that we're filling up and we have to do it in a particular way. No, we, we live in this life and we do so under the guidance of a spiritual guide. And this is what's difficult for him. And it's on him. Whatever mistake you make for what he says, it's not on you. It's on him. So scary for the priest, but freeing for you. All right. Um, uh, sorry, another story. Uh, there was a, this was just a few years ago with uh, Elder Emilio Nos. He was, a, he was an abbot of Simonopetra, another one of the, the Athenite monasteries. And there was a monk who had to take medicine every morning. And in the tradition of the church, before you receive communion, you don't eat or drink anything. And they were very strict at this monastery. So this monk said, can I not take my medicine on the mornings that I receive communion? And the abbot said, no, you have to take your medicine. You have to, you know, to be healthy. He's like, well, can I still receive communion? And the abbot says, no, your communion is the medicine. So what did he do? He did exactly what his abbot said. For him, his communion was the medicine. Communion's not magic, right? It's not, a, it's not a magic potion. It's something that we participate in, in the life of the church. And if your spiritual father directs you to do something like that, it's not that, you know, now all of a sudden you haven't received this magic potion. If he says your medicine is, your, is communion, then that's what it is, Okay. So freeing, very, very freeing. Um, and it gets rid of these rules. The rules are hard. Who wants to follow these rules? No, we live in this relationship and allow uh, you know, this, this type of obedience to free us from, from these rules and from these responsibilities. So it, it makes it easier. I think it makes it easier. But anyway, any uh, last questions? He's not very good on time. We need to get him a timer. Did you, the iconographer, did he have to like fly him in? <clears throat> yeah, so uh, the iconographer, his name is Diomondopoulos, Diamond. Um, he's, uh, I think he's from Athens. But yeah, we, we, we fly him in and then he, he comes with a team of two guys, I think. He's, he's been here two, two times, maybe, maybe three, I think two times. Yeah, so this is in, in, in two sessions that he's done this. Yeah, yeah. Do they ever have to be, like, updated when they start to bathe? Um, good question. Uh, I've never really experienced that. When I go to visit, uh, the icons come on canvas, and they put the canvas on the wall, and they put a protective uh, like varnish or clear coat over it. Really? Yeah. Like, like, so all, all of these, I'm pretty sure, are um, canvas that's put up on the wall. They are canvas, yeah. These are not. It depends. Some churches you go to, they will be just wall paintings where they go up and, and they, they paint directly on the wall. These are canvases. It's a lot quicker, right? They do all the, all the major figures um, at, at their studio, and then they fill in the surroundings here. Yeah, it's very cool. 
Yeah. yeah. I have a question about like choosing a sponsor. Yeah. For baptism. Yeah. Do does the your sponsor have some kind of authority over you or? I I you know I instead of saying sponsor I would say godparent. Yeah. So think about it in the context of, of a godparent. One, someone who you recognize some spiritual authority or in a way, or spiritual maturity at least, right? Somebody who's been in the life of the church and who can, you know, answer questions. Not just a buddy, but somebody who has, you know, some, some uh, ability to mentor and, and, and offer some authority. Um, and uh, along with that... Is there, is there a responsibility that they... Well, they, ha, they certainly have a strong responsibility to you. And I would say, yeah, there is a level of authority there, right? Like a parent. If your sponsor comes along and says, Aiden, you need to stop doing this thing. You should be like, you're right, I do. So yeah, I, 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 and, I, and I think it's good to probably find somebody who uh, has that level of authority and that you have a respect for in that way. Um, again, not just a buddy, right? But but somebody who can who can be a, a guide as well, and that might not be somebody that you're necessarily necessarily friends with. You'd be like, oh, I've seen this person, and you know, I want to continue to develop a relationship and recognize their their position in the church, and you know, I respect them. Then great. Um, so yeah, there's no again no formula, but definitely I would say somebody who has maturity, yeah, in the, in the church. All right, let's see if we can... Oh, can you get Father Evan?